With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. So you might have heard that the Derek Chauvin verdict has finally happened over a year after the George Floyd killing. We know his fate. The former Minneapolis police officer was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. And that might not be all. He's also facing a federal indictment. Now, we all see the national figures and talking heads. They show up for the verdict, and the news coverage will once again be hot and heavy for a topic that seemingly has been going on since the moment the George Floyd videos first came to light. But what's going on locally in Minneapolis? How is it seen there? We know the figures that come and go for the press conferences will fade a little bit, and the media circus will fade again, but what are the people in Minneapolis feeling? After all, this was in their community. It was those folks that have to live with all the consequences of this, both the verdicts and the feelings, and we saw the protests and violence and destruction that came from some of that last summer. So what are they feeling, and what are they thinking? Well, we're going to turn down the noise from everything involving George Floyd and Derek Chauvin and those issues and talk to somebody that's actually in Minneapolis, our friend Dennis Saunders, who's a writer and a commenter. He has his own podcast as well, but he lives in Minneapolis. He pastors a church in neighboring St. Paul. He wrote about what it was like to walk around downtown where all this destruction was after the protests and violence. And obviously he has an opinion and a local's perspective on everything that we've been watching on the national news. So we're going to talk to Dennis Sanders directly about things like the Derek Chauvin verdict. How did it land with them? What about the George Floyd incident where he was killed by the police on video? Those images that everybody's seen now. But we're also going to ask him about some of the background. Why was this such a powder keg in Minneapolis? What happened before that? And he'll talk about how this isn't the first incident, but one in a long line of them, going back to the Philando Castiles and other incidences over the years. He's going to give us the local perspective on how these things developed. And also, you'll hear it from somebody who really cares about his community. He'll talk about how... Things like race and social justice and criminal justice reform aren't just words. They're things that need to be practically applied in the communities. And he has some ideas on how that can be done. So we're going to turn down the noise on the Derek Chauvin verdict. All the stuff you may have heard tell about the George Floyd killing. We're going to talk to somebody who actually lives in that community, cares about that community, and what lessons all of us, regardless of where we live or what our backgrounds are, can learn from it. So Dennis Saunders, coming up next on Her Tell. very happy to have somebody whose opinion I greatly respect, somebody's point of view who, although we agree on many things and disagree on others, he comes from it from a very different perspective than me, so I always listen to his opinion very closely. And he's a Minneapolis resident, so he's perfect to go and talk about these issues with the Derek Chauvin verdict. Our friend Dennis Sanders, how are you, my friend? I am doing well. How are you doing? Good. I really appreciate you taking the time. We see the national figures and the political figures, they show up for things like the sentencing verdict. Uh, They all show up at the camera, and then they'll dissipate again. It's been a couple of days. You're a Minneapolis resident. You live there. You work in the community. You minister in that community. What is it on the ground, the locals? They've had a couple days to think about it when they've been spending their weekend, when they went to church this morning. How how is that verdict, Derek Chauvin, 22 and a half years, how is that landing with the people that actually live there? Well, I think that for most people, it's pretty much what people expected. They didn't expect that they were going to get on the low, the lower end, um, which would have been about 22 or 12 years. Um, and I think most people weren't thinking it was going to be 40, um, which is what the prosecution was um, looking for. So I think that there will be, and there has already been, some people will say that it's not enough. Um, and I think that's going to be expected. I think the, what's going to be the interesting thing is what happens in the days and weeks, um, coming and how we, um, deal with all this. And what does that mean for, uh, policing here in Minnesota? Will there be any reforms as a result of the verdict? 
you know, I think it's going to take a while for us to realize or figure out, does this have an effect? Is this just a one-off? Or can it really make some change um, here in Minnesota? Now, have you seen any change uh, at your level? Because a lot of us externally, uh, a lot of us that follow national politics, there, there's definitely been a narrative of lost opportunity that, you know, we're a year and month or two away from when the George Floyd happened. We saw all the subsequent events that happened after that with other people, Breonna Taylor, Robert Aubrey, all these other folks. Does it feel like that locally, too, that there was a missed opportunity here, that the narrative changed even with the sentencing coming out and, and folks seeing that he got a pretty stiff penalty kind of on the medium high side of penalties? Mm-hmm. Does it feel like that there? Because nationally, it kind of feels like the the push for, however you want to phrase it, social justice, uh, criminal justice reform, police reform, it feels like a lot of the positive come-togetherness has waned and there was a lost opportunity. Do you feel that there locally, or does it feel differently there that there's going to be some progress? I think people feel that it's moving slowly. Um, there were some reforms that were pushed through uh, last year in the state legislature, I think that there is some talk about um, some more reforms um, in with the legislature. Uh, unfortunately, though, the legislature is only meeting until July 1st. Um, they're already in kind of an extended session. Um, so I don't think that there's going to be anything that's going to be happening this year. and uh, probably won't be happening until unless they, they are able to work out a special session. Um, other than that, it'll be next year. Um, so I think the reforms are going slowly. And I think generally the, the, the public would want to see something more definitive happening. I think people understand it, or at least glad that there has been some change, but I think that there really needs to be um, more. And I think most people would, would say, and, and you know, it, it runs the gamut from those who are saying, you know, there needs to be, you know, a few more things. And I think they were talking about one of the more recent um, additions is something about with no knock warrants um, to people who basically just want to not have the police or, or re- redesign the police. Um, and I think, you know, what's going to have to bring about some of that change, obviously, there's going to be have to be legal ch- um, changes coming from the state. Um, but I think the other part of that is um, police departments in the state are going to have to, um, even of themselves, before, um, regardless of what the state itself does, um, try to reestablish trust. Because I think what has happened is that there is a lot of, of mistrust now about um, the police. Some would say, and I would agree, that there has been a lot of mistrust for years, especially within the African American community. But I think that the murder of George Floyd kind of really put that over, and that trust has to be rebuilt. And, um, you know, obviously laws can um, help with that, but it also has to come from those institutions. And I don't know if that's I think the way that the the um, departments are structured right now makes it really hard for them to change internally. Um, there has been talk about reform within the Minneapolis Police Department for years, and I think people have tried, but there are a lot of other institutional um, roadblocks that make that very hard, um, especially the police union has, has definitely been a major roadblock. So, you know, I think there is a lot more that can be done legislatively, but I also think it's going to have to be um, those police departments that are going to have to really try to establish some trust with the wider community. Tell us, because you're you're a Minneapolis person, give us a little bit of that history, if you would, because we, we know nationally what's going on. We We know all the buzzwords of, you know, police reform and things like this, but why, why is that trust broken specifically in Minneapolis? We, we understand things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a sequence. So as, as a local, how would you explain it to a national or international audience of 
here's the sequence of why George Floyd was such a match for the powder keg in this specific, besides just the awful images that everybody could see. What was it to Minneapolis that went, this is an a accumulation to a lot of them? Ooh, if you have a few hours. Um, sure, I get it. I get it but. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think part of it is if you go back to uh, 2016 with Philando Castile, um, that did yeah. not happen in Minneapolis proper. It happened in um, Falcon Heights, which is kind of um, directly north of St. Paul and east of Minneapolis. So it's kind of wedged in between the two. Um, but what a lot of people may have forgotten um, about Philando Castile is that before his being shot, he had been pulled over many, many, many times to the point of, you know, having his license suspended and all of that. And it wasn't because he was someone that was knowingly breaking the law. It was for things, you know, maybe a taillight out. Maybe it was a, for whatever reason. I mean, there were very kind of small reasons, and I think in some cases no reason. Um, and that had happened over and over and over again. Um, and recently there was a video... Um, of these two people, it was on CNN, and it was two people here in the Twin Cities, a black man and a white woman. And he talked about a recent case where he was stopped and dealing with some type of either a warrant for his arrest, and it actually turned out the whole thing was it wasn't him. But I mean, the people, and this was in Richfield, which is um, just immediately south of Minneapolis, the um, police came, you know, me basically, you know, in a very nice manner, but still they had the, their guns ready. And so, you know, and again, the end of that day was just, there was, they got the wrong person, but, you know, that could have been another Philando Castile or another George Floyd. And I think the thing that we don't know, people don't know nationally is that it's been these little things that have happened over the years that have really led to this. And... Like, as you said, it just didn't happen out of, come out of nowhere. Uh, and, you know, related to that, I think, has been the, how African Americans kind of make their way in this community. A few years ago, at the Atlantic magazine, did this really kind of um, glowing piece about the Twin Cities as a good place to live. And, you know, on some level, they're correct. There are lots of good things here in the Twin Cities to talk about. However, when it comes to the life of African Americans living in the community, it is not so rosy. It can be, it's very hard to find jobs. There are, the amount of people uh, of African Americans owning their own homes in the Twin Cities is incredibly low. I remember some of the other percentages when it deals with lifestyle or um, quality of life for people was lower than even that out of Mississippi. So there are these things that have shown that life for African Americans here is not easy and hasn't been easy. Um, you know, this is the place where we kind of talk about, of course, that it is the place where Garrison Keillor gets Lake Wobegon. And I think for a lot of years, many people thought that Minnesota was that kind of a place, that it was a, a small town and, um, Kind of, as they say, the people are, are, are good looking and the children are above average, but the reality is very different. You know, again, as an African American, I'm not going to say it's a horrible place, but it has more problems sometimes than people are willing to admit. And I think what happened last year really opened people's eyes that there were, there were problems that I think the wider community hadn't really paid attention to for years. And so, um, what happened with George Floyd was really the result of a lot of different actions, whether it's police stops to just how African Americans have been treated um, in the community to until they got to this point that it was just this was the last straw. Um, to your point, uh, writing in The Atlantic in June of 2020, so this would have been immediately after uh, George Floyd was killed. Uh, Justin Ellis had a piece called Minneapolis had this coming. My hometown faces not just a rebuilding, but a reckoning. Well, a reckoning 
preacher, as you know, the, the term means is we're going to establish something. Do you think it's been established now what the problems are in Minneapolis that need to be dealt with going forward? Not just the, the police aspect, but the cultural aspect, the lack of trust, the lack of uh, governmental accountability, the way the culture with minority communities and people of color has been changing despite that idyllic veneer that you talked about that's been there in the past. Do you feel like this is a reckoning moment or do you think that it's going to be more of the same? I don't know. I, I think in some ways it's too early to tell. I think that there has been a lot of talk about things that need to be done. One example, I think that there are some steps that I think people are trying to do. Um, I think the, the, the question is how do you wrap your arms around an issue that is so complex and has so many decades behind it? Um, I think one way of seeing how it may be changing is in the area, the area that I like to follow a lot is transportation. Um, hmm. We're kind of slowly putting together our uh, light rail system. Um, we're not at the point of Portland yet, but we're getting there. And um, one of the final lines going in is a um, train that goes from uh, downtown Minneapolis um, to the northwest suburbs. And initially, it was going to go down one route um, that would kind of go through parts of North Minneapolis, where I live, but not all of it. And now they are actually scrapping that route and thinking of going down um, two different streets, um, uh, Broadway, which is kind of um, the main street in North Minneapolis, and then Lowry Avenue, which is actually a street very close to me. Um, this would put it basically right into the area of North Minneapolis, where I think the majority of, of the city's African Americans live. And as people know, whenever you put in a, a light rail line or any type of dedicated transit line, it's going to change things. And so I think in this case, this is one example with our transit company or transit authority trying to do something maybe to ameliorate or, or make life better. So, you know, and that's something that they did. They started thinking about that very shortly after kind of the unrest happened. So they were quick in trying to do something. And, but when it comes to kind of other entities, not so much yet. Um, and some of it, I think, is, is just simply inertia. Some of it is, I think we just don't know what to do. You know, we have to try to do something with schools. Some of the rates for African Americans um, is, are pretty low uh, com in the, compared to the rest of the country. So how do we improve that? And how do we um, work with local school districts um, to make things better? We have to try to deal with the kind of economic development and what does that mean and how does it do that? Um, and so it's a lot of different things that uh, the community has to figure out, um, and especially the state legislature. And all of that's going to be a challenge because you're going to get pushback. And and I, I remember last year when we were kind of talking about some of this stuff, um, the way that the state legislature is set up, it's actually split. So the Republicans control one house and the Democrats another house. Um, and it's interesting that the GOP right now doesn't, they want to kind of talk about violence in the Twin Cities, which I think is always interesting because it's kind of like, okay, that is a problem, but are we going to talk about some of these other economic issues of face, facing African Americans? Um, so it's kind of like they're not yet ready to try to kind of talk about that. And the fact is, you have to. This isn't trying to put people on a guilt trip. It's about how do we resolve some of these disparities? And, and there are some major disparities. Um, and some of it can, I think, can be solved easily if where there are, can just do things like what the Transit Authority did. But some of them are going to take some time. And, but 
it's not going to happen unless we're willing to work on it. And we're willing to actually to see this as a problem that we need to solve and that it's not someone else's problem. Um, because I think right now, well, I won't say right now everyone thinks this way, but there is still a fair amount of people that would say that this is someone else's problem. And I just don't think we can do that anymore. And now that I would say our, our cover has been blown, um, we don't really have that the luxury of trying to hide anymore. Um, there's no way to talk about the George Floyd incident without talking about media and social media. We wouldn't know about this except for the Darnella Frasers of the world that videotaped it uh, on their phone. Uh, videotape, I'm showing my age, but showed it on their phone, right? Yes. Um, I don't think it's accidental that we're talking about this, you know, are we having a moment of reckoning here or not? I historically, it's not accidental that the civil rights movement came up when we started having national television. People could actually see it. Mm -hmm. um, they could see, you know, Bull Connor fire hosing people. They could see George Wallace in the door of the schools. They could see the troops escorting the children in and just go, well, that don't look right. That ain't right. Mm -hmm. When they saw George Floyd on the ground and Eric Chauvin on his back, they may not have knew all the legalities and the technicalities and maybe all the back history of Minneapolis. They could just look at it and go, this ain't right. Mm -hmm. So to you, because you're the local, you're also a pastor in that area. You, you've got your finger on the pulse of the local folks. Do, do they feel like the world's eyes are on them? So when you say it's blown our cover, do they think this is our moment where the world is seeing what we've been living and then that's giving them some hope or is it giving them some despair of they're seeing this and it's still not changing? It's a little bit of both. I think it is that the cover has been blown. And I think there are people in the community that feel we have to do something. We can't, we can't just ignore this or can't just kind of whistle past the graveyard anymore. And so, you know, there is some work happening that will try to change some things. Um, but I think it's going to be slow. Um, none of this happened in a few weeks time and it's not going to be solved in a few weeks time it's, it, this is probably a generation project and and so it's going to leave people at times frustrated and i think you know people everyone is going to feel at times that it's not moving fast enough um but it, i think that's kind of the way it will be unfortunately but um better to have it moving even at a snail's pace than not having it move. Um, I, I think the thing that has been interesting is that we have seen it on um, video. And I, again, I go back to Philando Castile because that was another one that was shown on video. And um, right. what is interesting about all of that is it, the video only maybe shows, a, you know, it's kind of like an iceberg. So that you see part of the Correct. problem, but you don't see all of it. And as I said before about the, all the traffic stops that um, Castile had to deal with before that final one, um, in a lot of ways, that's kind of what we're dealing with here as a community. Is we, you know, we've seen kind of what's happened with George Floyd um, and how Derek Chauvin treated him, but there's a big um, iceberg below all of that. And to break that up, it's going to take a lot of time. And it's going to take a lot of community stakeholders to come together to really talk about it. Um, and, you know, it, that's, it's going to take time, but I think we have to be willing to work together on it and be creative. Um, and like I said earlier about the transit authority, some of it is just looking at some of the things that we do now and saying, well, how can we improve this? Or how can we make this more beneficial? Um, and, you know, you can't, it's not going to be as easy as what they did in moving a, a, a light rail line. But it, I think it can be done. It's just how we can get the community and in some ways the state um, because the Twin Cities are kind of the economic engine for the entire state, 
is how to, to work together to solve these issues. You're talking about folks coming together and talking about it. Isn't that part of the problem here is we don't really know how to talk about justice? I mean, we use the term justice. That That's almost like using the term love. It's kind of an idyllic state of itself, and it doesn't really mm-hmm. give you all the, the grinding hard work that goes into something like love in a relationship or like justice, all the things that ha- all these steps that have to go to get to justice. Is that part of the problem here is we, we, we have the political, we don't want to be Pollyannish here. We know there's a political level to all this. But there's also a practical level where you're talking about, like, well, what does light rail or economic things have to do with race? And you start talking about, well, you have to integrate a city before people can be together. Mm-hmm. It's part of it. We just don't know how to talk about something like justice. It's a complicated thing. But do we need a new lexicon for it? Do we need more understanding? It, there seems to be a, an element of people of good faith that just talk right past each other, even when they're trying, when it comes to something like justice, doesn't it? I think it is. I think, you know, and especially even in a case like this, what people sometimes want to do is, you know, we'll, we'll talk about all the, the background concerning race, um, you know, slavery and Jim Crow. We'll kind of talk about right, white supremacy. And all of those are issues that are important. But we need to also just sit down and talk about how do we solve these issues and it's going to be hard for everyone on all sides. You can't just say that it's just one person's side to, to solve. All of us have to sit down and solve it. And it, it means that we're going to have to go through, I think, a painful process of deciding, you know, how do we handle this? How do we see a kid that is living in North Minneapolis that's probably going to a school that has a really not great record when it comes to um, testing and all of that to improve enough that someone from there can have a chance, a shot at going to college or just even getting a good career, period. And all of that is not easy. Um, because it means and sometimes it would mean it in some cases that you have to give up some things or doing some sacrifice. Um, and sometimes it means to accept blame and that's hard too because no one wants to no one wants to come around looking like they hate people or something. And I you know I don't think that that is always the case that, you know, I tend to believe that there is some something uh, to the effect of, of having racism without racists. And, but it's all hard. And I think what we need to do is start the conversation, knowing that it's going to take some time, knowing that it's not going to be easy, and knowing that it's going to be frustrating. But this is one of the things at the end of the day, the only way to paint the barn is to paint the barn. And, you know, kind of get away from the high sounding words but actually to get down to the nitty-gritty did you see some of that now we all saw the images of the protests we saw the things that devolved into riots where things were destroyed buildings Mm -hmm. were burned down businesses destroyed a lot of those businesses were minority businesses Mm -hmm. um but did you see some of that when the cameras and the attention went off how is the city itself and the people of the city did did they come together after that to try to clean it up Give give folks a little bit of hope here for the people of Minneapolis and St. Paul and the Twin City area that that wasn't the end of the story just because the cameras went off. What happened after that that maybe gives you some hope that people do want that in the future? Well, here's something that was fascinating just, and this was maybe the Sunday after um, George Floyd's murder. So this was maybe two or three days after some of the worst of the rioting take, had taken place. Okay. And... Um, my husband and I went down to a um, protest at the state capitol in St. Paul. We were heading back home to Minneapolis, and I wanted to kind of see some of this, um, what was going on. And so we went and drove to Blake and Hiawatha. And for those who don't live in the Twin Cities, that's basically ground zero where the, the rioting happened. Um, That's where the third precinct is. Um, And so we walked around and it 
looked like one of those pictures that you would see of a bombed out European city after war in, in World War II. Um, you know, you saw buildings that were basically just the facade and that's it. Um, everything else was torched. Um, and so it was just a lot of horrible, unbelievable scenes um, to see. But the sign of hope that I saw, um, there was a place, uh, basically what was the ruins of what was in Arby's. Um, and, you know, there was kind of building rubble and all that. And the community, there were people there that just came, they came with brooms and they were cleaning things up. And it were people from all different backgrounds, all different races and ethnicities coming together to clean it up. Um, and of course, trying to clean up, not even a damaged building. I mean, the building was basically, I, as I said, it was just a pile of rubble. Um, to do that wasn't an easy thing, but they were doing it and they were all working together to do that. So that gives me some hope. Um, I think that there are people in the community that they really want to do something. They really want to have Minneapolis and St. Paul live up to at least the, the high-minded rhetoric that we claim to live by. And so that gives me some sense of hope. Um, I don't think it, it's a no-win situation. I don't think that it's hopeless. Um, like I said earlier, I think it's going to it's going to be a challenge. But what I saw on that Sunday um, gave me some sense of hope that things can can get better, and I think that they will get better. It's it's one of those things where no matter how dark these things get and these issues get, we got to give people some hope because giving them exactly. no hope is is just a recipe to make the situation even worse. So I think we see that. You know, not just rhetorically of us just, oh, it's easy for you to say, but that's what history has taught us, whether it's the, you know, you mentioned World War II or the Civil Rights Movement or whatever the dark points in history are. If you don't give people hope and then you, it just makes it worse instead of getting better. Politics is is the messy end of this, but you talked about some of the, the, the things you did. Is it that the politics, maybe we should focus a little bit more on the things we can change, like, hey, we can try to make this this neighborhood a little more economically integrated. We can try to make the police, uh, we can work with the police and the community together to try to get them on the same page at least. I is that where we need to be focusing the politics and policy side of this a little bit more than maybe just trying to do, well, let's do this big sweeping legislation thing that may or may not pass anyway? It, do you think maybe that's the angle we need to to give people a little bit more hope because maybe they'll see some movement? I think so. I think one of the dangers, especially it, it, right in the aftermath of, of everything that happened last year, um, you know, Minneapolis and very much in the, especially the city council, very much into the whole kind of defund the police talk. And I don't think that that's going to help. We still need a police department. Um, as imperfect as it is, we still need them. So, and it, that kind of rhetoric seems almost kind of utopian. It's it's not necessarily realistic. And so what needs to happen are things like how do we, what are the things that we can do with police in the state that can make things better? And there are things that we can do. I mean, I think we I talked about no-knock warrants. That's something that definitely we can work on. Um, Qualified immunity also is something that we can work on. We need kind of those are the things I think we need our bread and butter things. They're not sexy. Um, you're not going to be able to put them on a bumper sticker, but those are the things that are going to change things. Those are the things that are going to make a difference. And, you know, we need to do some things about how do we kind of deal with when do we stop someone or who or who gets to stop someone? If there's something like a warrant in that case where there was a person who they got the wrong person that could have ended in a tragedy, how do we reform that in a way that allows the police to do their job but not necessarily put someone, um, threaten someone um, simply because they look 
basically share the skin color of someone who may have broken the law. And I think, you know, in other areas, whether it's jobs or um, schools, it's really trying to find those practical solutions. They're not easy solutions, but they're, but they're possible. But I think the, 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 the danger at the moment right now is to kind of focus on a, on a utopian solution. And there is no utopian solution. All we have is, is what we can do um, to make things better. And though things are not easy, but I think that they're going to do a lot more than um, believing that defunding the police is going to be the answer. It's a whole other topic for another day, but I, I think we should have a national conversation about why we quit calling police peace officers. Because I, yes. I think there's, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of heft to that term if we take it seriously. But that's another discussion for another day. Uh, my friend Dennis Sanders, you write, uh, you write for us at Ordinary Times. You're at Medium. You have your own podcast. You have other things going on. Tell folks where they can find you and what you have going on because. Any anytime you read or put out a podcast or something, uh, you're a voice I always listen to very carefully. I value your opinion. Tell folks what you have going on and where they can find you so that they can hear you out too. All right. Well, I um, do have a podcast. It's called En Route, um, and it is a podcast where I talk about religion, politics, and culture. And you can find it at um, En Route Podcast, all one word dot org. And it's available on all of the uh, regular podcast platforms that everyone knows about. Uh, the other thing is I do uh, write articles um, for um, at Medium. And um, if you're interested in that, you can go to uh, Dennis Sanders, all one word, dot medium, dot com. And uh, finally, if you want to follow me on uh, Twitter, uh, you can follow me at um, Denmin, which is D E N M I N N, and uh, yeah, and then also follow me on um, at Ordinary Times. And we'll definitely have to do a transportation talk at some point because you know my background's actually in transportation. So oh yeah, we'll uh, we'll hammer one of those out in the near future, my friend. But uh, Dennis Sanders, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for uh, representing uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the Twin Cities to the rest of us. And uh, I appreciate you greatly, my friend. Thank you. It was always it's always great. Thank you, sir. Dennis really hit on something that's kind of become a bit of a theme on these hard tell shows that we've been doing. He talked about how Minneapolis's perception in the water world and how something like the George Floyd killing has, quote, blown its cover. It's true with everybody, though. Social media and things like this do a lot of exposing. It's kind of like money, power, and alcohol. It's just going to show you more of what you really are. And unfortunately, that usually means it's going to show us the problems and things that we need to work on, both as people and as a community or a city or even a nation. So when something like the George Floyd killing happens, yeah, it applies and hits everybody a little bit differently because it's so visceral. When you see that video, almost everyone of good faith looked at that and said something very wrong happened here. And then we had to have a long national conversation about what to do about that. Now, the legal system has had its say, and Derek Chauvin will be spending the most of the rest of his life in prison, probably at least 15 years or so of a 22 and a half year sentence, most legal experts think. And that's before the federal indictment works its way through courts. But that mostly only affects Derek Chauvin and his family. Of course, it's symbolic for everybody else, but that community has to go on today and tomorrow and in the weeks and months ahead. What are they going to do? What are all the rest of us going to do? It's not just confined to Minneapolis. We've seen incident after incident after incident like this in other places. Now, it's easy to just watch the violence of the protests and sometimes the riots that happen after that and write it off and say, well, those folks over there are destroying their own city. What do I care? Well, you should care because it might happen in your city. And how we do law and order and how we do things like justice, that big word that's so hard to define, but everybody wants to throw it around and everybody seems to be seeking it and seeking it in different ways is something we better figure out in a hurry. Because if we don't figure out, we're going to keep doing this over and over and over again. It was a great silent film actor, Charlie Chaplin, who said this. He said, I don't think real America is in New York or the Pacific Coast, personally. I like the Mid Middle West much better. Places like South Dakota and Minneapolis and St. Paul. There, I think, 
are the true Americans. Well, we're all Americans, but if it happens in Minneapolis, it can certainly happen where we live. And if we can help them figure it out, maybe we can help ourselves figure it out, and we'll all be the better for it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Herd Tell. So appreciate the feedback we've been getting. You can email us, herdtellshow at gmail.com or on Twitter at herdtellshow. Uh, you can also leave comments anywhere that these podcasts are being streamed, downloaded, and you're subscribing to. In fact, if you would comment, leave a rating, those are very important because that tells those services that our little program is worth checking out and lets other people know that we're doing good things here and that they should give it a listen. Also, we're now on YouTube. Uh, you can definitely comment. If you leave a comment, we will try to reply to you on there. But the YouTube channel is up, so you can check that out as well. We're going to keep doing these as long as you keep listening. So wherever you and yours are across the street or around the world, we hope you find you well, and y'all take care of yourselves. All the music on Her Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.